Good evening. It's great to see everyone here in this room this evening. Uh, welcome to all of you who are participating with us online. Uh, I have a few words from scripture I wanted to read to uh, begin our time of worship. This is from Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Tell you about our classes for this evening. Uh, tonight here in the auditorium, we're continuing our journey with Moses. Uh, Colby Wallace will be bringing our lesson for this evening in here. Uh, we have two other classes. One of them listed here on the screen. Uh, the, the youth class will be meeting as they have been in the youth room. Uh, we are also offering a class for fourth and fifth grade this evening. And for tonight only, that will be in the fellowship hall. Uh, the plan for next week is to be in the typical fourth and fifth grade room, so uh, if anybody here is needing to share in that, uh, fourth and fifth graders fellowship hall this evening. I had one update to our uh, prayer concerns list uh, here just a moment ago before we started, and it's a bit of good news from the Proctor family. Uh, you know we've been praying for, for uh, Richard's father, Bill. Uh, he got some results back from his recent times at the doctor that uh, the area surrounding his tumor looks really good, and it seems to be a slow-growing tumor, so they're hopeful to, to have a surgery to remove the tumor. Uh, so in, in Richard's words, that was about as good a news as you could hope for in, in the situation. Uh, and so we want to thank God for that and also pray for uh, those upcoming steps. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord, our Holy Father, we give thanks to you and, and praise you for all that you do for us and, and the difference that you've made in our lives. Right now, we just take a moment and slow down in the middle of our week. Remember that you are God and that we are called and obligated and blessed to obey you and follow you and become like you in our lives. Lord, you've given us a purpose. Uh, you've given our lives an identity and a, and a meaning, and we thank you for that. Lord, we pray over all of those who are uh, in need of your care tonight. Uh, we, we think about those in our, our church family and also those that we may know personally. We think about our country and we think about all of those who... Um, maybe in need right now. We thank you for the good news that uh, the Proctor family received about uh, Bill's prognosis, and we pray that it will indeed continue to be good news and that as they take the next steps in his treatment, that you would be with him and that you would uh, bless them through all of that. Lord, we thank you most of all for your son, Jesus, and the, the difference he's made for us and the hope that we have because of him. In all these things we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Number 528. <clears throat> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him.
we want to remember our Hispanic uh, family that lost the grandmother, Norma and uh, Noemi Munoz, uh, and they're passing their memorial service will be tomorrow morning at Greenwood. Also, uh, Ron Smith had surgery, I believe it was yesterday, if not as Monday, and uh, they had to, after they got him back from surgery, they had to go back and do some additional work because he was having significant pain in an area that they had not suspected they had to deal with. Also, uh, our longtime members will remember Webb Jordan. Webb is, or was last evening in the hospital in Abilene suffering from apparently heart issues. They had to revive him three times. So Cindy Lively had reported on Facebook. So this is the information that we have. I did not get an update today. Anyway, I know there's a host of our own members that we want to remember in our prayers. So would you join me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we come before you today. We do want to remember that you are holy and that we need to practice recognizing the holiness that you have and our submission unto you. As we come to you tonight, we pray, Father, that through your healing hand and through your comforting hand, that these that we've mentioned tonight and those that are in our uh, prayer concerns uh, uh, listing of the, of the congregation can be comforted, can be healed, and can be uh, uh, helped through this troubling time that we're experiencing in dealing with an abnormal uh, illness, trend, and infection difficulty that we have to deal with and make special uh, consideration for. Pray, Father, as we study your word tonight and spend time in your word that we will continue to focus on you as our strength and the giver of all uh, good and perfect gifts and the means for us to work our way through the difficulties by relying on you and coming to you in prayer often when that's needed. And I pray that you'd be with us as we, again, consider your word and worship tonight. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Our reading tonight's from Exodus chapter uh, 19, beginning with verse 3 through verse 6. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom, a priest, and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Worship the King, O glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, pavilion in splendor, and girded with praise, Thy bounty. Can recite. 
47. Come preach the word, Colby. Well, good evening. I hope you're doing well tonight. Uh, I just want to remind all of you guys who were praying for the cooler weather uh, that you caused this, like you brought this upon us. No, uh, it has been a relief uh, to see some cooler weather this week, albeit a very quick change in the weather. Uh, and I hope that you are happy to be here tonight. I know you've braved the chilly winds to be here, so we're thankful to see all of you. Uh, I know that I have enjoyed the beginning of our series together on Moses, and I'm excited to keep hearing these lessons that Stephen's going to do most of. Uh, and I was excited when he gave me the opportunity to speak into this, spirit, uh, this series tonight and to be able to dive into the life of Moses with all of you. Now, I asked Stephen whenever he unveiled this series if he realized what he had done in titling this series, right? Because he was talking about Moses, the life of Moses, and going into the unknown. And I said, Stephen, you have to realize what you've done. Do you watch Disney movies? Like, So there's a movie that came out not that long ago called Frozen 2. Uh, and the main song that they sing is Into the Unknown. So as I sat behind the monitor that first night that he did this, not knowing that this was the sermon series, it was all that I could do to help from belting out this song uh, that I watched because... My 18-year-old brother-in-law wanted us to go watch it in the movie theater, right? But no, I, I, I was doing everything I could to not sing this song. And Stephen said, well, Colby, you know, when you get up and preach, you'll have the opportunity to sing it if you want to for the audience. I'm saving all of you tonight. You will not hear me singing this song. Uh, and yet, I'm excited to be able to stand up here and talk with you guys tonight and dive into the life of Moses together. As Moses, with the children of Israel, deal with this kind of difficult period in their history, going into the wilderness, into the unknown, and following the God who leads them there tonight. So if you would like to get your Bibles out tonight and turn to Exodus chapter 19, uh, we'll be spending most of our time there and then in the chapter that follows in chapter 20. When we find the children of Israel tonight, so as we jump back into their story again tonight, they have been in the wilderness for around three months. The text tells us there at the beginning of chapter 19 that it's the third new moon. So they've been out for around three months in the wilderness. They've left Egypt. They have complained before God and then received both manna and quail as a result of their complaining. They have been given water where water did not previously uh, come easy for them. They have been delivered from their enemies, the Amalekites who attacked them, by the Lord God himself. And that story that Stephen talked about where Aaron and Hur raised Moses' hands as they fought against them. But here we are, uh, some three months after they've left Egypt, and they are still wandering around in the wilderness, still in a state of uncertainty into the unknown they have wandered for these three months. And you have to imagine that they're beginning to wander a little bit, right? Like, what exactly is it that we're doing here? Where are we going? What's going to happen? And they've seen the great things that God did for them in Egypt, yes. Uh, they have been taken care of, and they're not exactly in want at this point. But what exactly is it that they're doing out here? What is their plan? What is it that God wants them to do? They're being led by a cloud in the daytime, a pillar of fire at night. But where is it that this cloud and this pillar are leading them? And so finally, at this point in the story, the Israelites reach their destination. And we don't know what the Israelites were thinking. We don't know exactly what's going on in their minds. But they've seen how great God's power is. And what he, but what is he doing for them out here? And so some three months into our journey, Israel arrives at a place that we call Sinai. It's a place that Moses has been before. It's also called Horeb sometimes in the Bible. And if it's a place where God has already been revealed to Moses. This is the same mountain where God appeared to Moses in the burning bush. God leads his people back to this place. And it's here that God is going to answer some important questions for the children of Israel. First, God is going to tell slash show them who he really is. And secondly, God is going to explain to the people who he wants for them to be. And it's on this mountain 
that Israel is going to find their identity in this unknown place. God calls Moses up to the mountain and he tells him to let the people know in Exodus chapter 19, verse 3. Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words, Moses, that you are to speak to the people of Israel. God tells Moses, go let the people know that I have brought them here to discuss terms. I have an arrangement that I want you to propose for them. God has brought Israel here so that he can make them an offer. They have seen what God can do, and now he's giving them a choice. What will you choose? Do you want to have a new identity? Do you want that, Israel? God is giving them a chance to start over here. You used to be slaves in Egypt. You were used for uh, menial labor. You were treated harshly. You were killed without second thought. But now, God says, you have a choice. If you keep my covenant, you obey my voice, then you will be my people a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. What do you think that the people of Israel are going to say to that? Uh, Moses goes back to the people. He relays the message that God gave to him. And the people all say together in verse 8, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. They are stoked by this. They jump at the chance to be God's treasured possession among the nations, his people. And so Moses goes back to God and God says, okay, so I'll come down and I'll sign the paperwork for him. He says, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe you forever. Now the problem for the Israelites here is that they don't really know what they're signing up for. They don't know what it means to be God's people just yet. They've accepted an offer without hearing all the terms that God's going to lay out for it. But they know that this is an offer. That is absolutely too good to refuse. It's too good to turn down. Because they were slaves in Egypt. But now they can be God's kingdom of priests. They're finding their identity here. But they don't know exactly what that identity looks like just yet. And it's not unlike a time whenever I was in sixth grade and all my friends decided, and maybe you guys did these kinds of things as well, uh, made these rash decisions. We decided we were all going to be in a boy band together. Uh, And now I'm showing that I grew up in the 90s because boy bands were really big in the 90s. Uh, But we we had all decided that we were going to make this band and we were going to call it the Jelly Peppers. I don't remember who came up with that name, but it's a strange name all the same. Uh, And I don't know why, but we went around to every boy in the school pretty much and said, hey, do you want to be a part of the Jelly Peppers, the band we're starting? Do you want to be a part of it? And we pretty much got everyone to agree that they wanted to be a part of this band. And of course they did. They wanted to be in a rocking boy band with all of us cool sixth graders. And it wasn't until we stopped to think about it that we realized we really didn't know anything about being in a band, even though this was our idea to begin with. None of us could play an instrument. None of us had practiced any songs. We had no rhythm uh, at all to speak of. We were the worst boy band that never really existed, the Jelly Peppers. And we disbanded after three practices where we sat around and stared at each other not knowing what to do. Sometimes you want to be a part of something, right? You know that this is something that sounds like a good idea, something that you want to do. You want to find your identity in something even whenever you don't really fully understand what it is. And it's not quite to that extent for the children of Israel here tonight. But from the rest of this text, we see that they don't really yet understand what it is to be God's holy nation. His kingdom of priests. To have their identity tied up in who he is. And Israel tonight is going to find out very quickly what exactly that does mean. You see, they know God. They know that he's done mighty things for him. But what they do not know is what it means to be his people. So God tells Moses to prepare the people, prepare them, which already sounds like maybe they've uh, bit off more than they can chew, because he's going to come down and he's going to appear before them. Uh, He's going to descend onto the mountain. 
And it doesn't go exactly as you would expect, because the people who have been so quick to accept God's offer here become overwhelmed, not with excitement, but with fear. So verse 16 of chapter 19 says, On the morning of the third day, when the th- there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, so that all of the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. And the smoke went of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. So God descends here before the children of Israel on Sinai, thunder and lightning accompanying him. And he speaks to Moses in the thunder. And the people are trembling. The trumpet blast in their ears is just getting louder and louder. And God calls Moses up, says, come on up to the top of the mountain with me. Let's have a chat. Can you imagine what the people are thinking? Uh, Okay, Moses, see you later. Have fun up there with the thunder and the lightning and the fire and the smoke. Have fun talking to that God that is speaking literally by the thunder waves to us here tonight. And maybe it's not so much of a stretch to think that the Israelites are feeling a little bit overwhelmed here. A little unsure of what it is going to mean now as they've seen this God in a different way for them to be his people. Who are we? Who are we to stand before an almighty, powerful, and awesome God like this one? Moses is told by God to go down and warn the people. So he goes up and he's told to go back down and warn the people. Stay off of the mountain. Don't get too close to it because if you get too close to it, then the people might die. And that probably isn't making them feel any better whenever he tells them that. Who are we? How can we be the people of this great and holy God? It's in the midst of this trembling and assumed uncertainty that God redirects their focus here tonight. He reminds them that it's never really been about who they were. It's always about who he was. It's here that God delivers some of the most famous words in the entire Bible. Uh, What does he tell the people who have agreed to be his people? He starts not with who they are, but with who he is. What his identity really is. So Moses comes down to warn the people to stand clear, and then God utters these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children of the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. God's first words to the whole of Israel, uh, that he truly speaks to all of them, are not to tell them who they are. It's not to clarify for them just yet their identity, but to tell them who he is. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of slavery, up out of Egypt. I am a jealous God. Don't be mistaken by that. I am jealous, but I show my love to thousands of generations of those who love me. God does not tell Israel anything about who they are here. Nothing about the identity that he is about to give them. It's all about what he has done. All about who he is. But with this new identity comes a way uh, that the children of Israel must now live. Okay, this is who I am. But who I am, if you want to be my people, who I am is going to dictate now how you live. Their identity had nothing to do with who they are, but now it has to do with them accepting God, this God's identity, who he is. And that's going to shape their own. He tells them, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain, will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. 
Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land that, your Lord, that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against one another. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, his wife, his animals, anything. God tells them who he is. And then he tells them what it means to be his people. His identity shapes the identity of those who follow him into the wilderness here tonight. The God who calls Israel out of captivity is the God who tells them what it means to be his people. This is what it looks like, God says, if you want to be with me. You have followed me here to this mountain, and now I'm showing you how to leave here as my people and go to the place, go to the land that I am going to give to you. God calls Israel to this place so that he can teach them what it means to be his people. So that he can show them their identity. So that they can find their identity in this uncertain and unknown place. He appears to them and speaks in thunder. And he lays out for them who he is and what that means for their identity. And what would you know but that Israel happily accepts that identity without any further questions or trouble? Uh, and that's exactly what happens here, right? Uh, they just they run with this. They go with it. Not exactly. In fact, when God finishes speaking these words to the people, they are so thrown off by his awesome power and might that they look at Moses and this is what they say. You speak to us and we will listen. But do not let God speak to us, lest we die. The Israelites are afraid, they're trembling, and they tell Moses, you go and listen to God and hear what he has to say, and then you can report it back to us. But please, don't let God talk to us himself. They think that they're going to die, right? Can you imagine that? The God who tells them that he wants them to be his people, to be his holy nation, is so awesome and so powerful that when they stand before him and he tells them, I want you to be my people, they are horrified of his very voice. They don't know exactly what to think about this God. Has he done mighty deeds for us on our behalf? He has. Has he provided for us these three months in the wilderness? Absolutely he has. Do we want to be this close to him? And the answer to that is evidently not. They stand off at a distance while Moses, it says, draws nearer to the thick darkness surrounding God and where God is. Moses tries to tell them, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, and that you may not sin. Come closer, Moses is telling them. But the people are paralyzed. Their identity, the one who is asking them to find their identity in him, is there standing before them. But they're stuck standing there, scared, unsure what to do. They had no choice but to accept God for who he is as he reveals his might and power to them. They cannot deny his identity, not in the wake of this great display that they are all witnesses to. But what does that mean for them, for who they are? It's here that I think we can find a great truth about discovering our identities uh, as humans. It's often hard, even terrifying, I think, to come face to face with who we truly are. When our identity is put out in front of us, it can be a pretty frightening thing. It's like the plot of one of the greatest movies ever made, in my opinion, uh, and maybe you agree, Star Wars Episode V. The Empire Strikes Back. Uh, you probably already know what I'm going to do with this one here, right? Late in that movie, Luke Skywalker is fighting the big bad villain, Darth Vader. And Luke fights him, but he is overmatched. And he screams at him, you killed my father. Like He has overwhelming hatred for this one that he thinks has slain his dad. And this is the way that Luke views himself. He sees his fight against Vader as a story of redemption. As one of him avenging those who were wrongfully uh, killed. And that's what makes the next line of the movie one of the most memorable lines in cinema history, right? Darth Vader looks at Luke and he says, No, you've got it wrong. I am your father. And it rocks Luke's world here. Uh, he cannot believe that what he thought about himself is not true. He cannot believe that this evil man standing before him is the father that he had envisioned in his mind as a good 
honest, upright martyr. And I wonder what's harder to believe in that kind of a story. What is harder to believe? That Darth Vader is his father or that the construct that he'd created about the cause that he fights for has just been shattered? Like Luke has set out to make a difference and to avenge those that he lost, but he discovers that the basis upon which he has made all of his plans is actually not entirely true. His dad is alive, and he's not the person that he thought that he was. This is undoubtedly the life-freezing challenge for those who discover their own identity. Sometimes it isn't what we thought it was, but we have to face it from time to time. Israel stands at the foot of Sinai, and they realize exactly who God is. They know exactly who this God that they've been following up to this point is. His identity is made clear, but that illuminates their own. They are not a holy nation. They probably don't feel much like a treasured possession in their own eyes. And how could they be? They have complained and grumbled their way to this mountain of God where he's revealed himself to them. And here he is now, greater than they ever could have imagined. Are they really supposed to believe that this God wants them to be his people? Well, luckily for them and for us today, God's calling of Israel is not as much about their identity as it is about his own. God is powerful and awesome and even terrifying to the people here, yes. But he is kind and steadfast and long-suffering with his people as well. He calls Israel because of his promises and his faithfulness, not because of their great renown or faithfulness to him. This is the way that it is for us as well. God has called us, church, to be his people. We are his children by no merit of our own, but because he created us in his very image. God is the same God, and as far as he is concerned, we have not changed either. We are the sheep of his pasture, his covenant people, his holy nation, his kingdom of priests. And so what we have to ask ourselves tonight is, what do we do now? Where does that take us? Like Israel, we may be frightened whenever we realize who he really is. We may struggle to stand close to him, to seek him once we know how, how magnificent he really is and can be. We may have questions about who he says that we are. Can we really be his children tonight? But like Israel before us, we have to come to grips with the one whose identity is clear. And the identity that he speaks upon us as well. It's hard to grasp who he really is, who God is. But sometimes it's harder to comprehend what that truth about who God is means for us as his children. So God starts with himself. Uh, he tells Israel, this is who I am. This is now who I have made you to be. Our challenge as children of God is not to focus on ourselves, because we know ourselves well enough when we truly, deeply look at ourselves. But we have to look at God, the God who makes clear to us our identity in him. Maybe not on his holy mountain, maybe not on Sinai, like he does with Israel, but through his son, Jesus Christ. You know, when in the wilderness, it is made painfully obvious to Israel who they are and who they are not. It's even more apparent who God is. And this is a jarring experience for all of the people who witness it. Maybe we can feel that same way today. Uh, it's often hard to know who we are in this world, isn't it? Are we led by God? Sure. Are we trying to follow him every day? Absolutely. But whenever we are in the wilderness, whenever we're walking into unknown times and unknown places, whenever life is hard and we aren't at our best, it becomes glaringly clear to us who God is and who we are not. So what do we do? Do we sit and wish that we had never come into this place, into this wilderness, into this unknown territory? Do we ignore the truth of who God is and what he expects from us and just act like he expects nothing? Do we stand terrified, hoping that someone else will get closer, someone else will step further into that unknown that we don't want to come to grips with, and just tell us what it is that God has to say to us? Do we hope that someone else will be brave and we get to stand back? Israel has this difficult and scary encounter with God 
one that tests their resolve and their perceptions of themselves, but ultimately they decide that they will do what God has asked them to do. In Exodus chapter 24, verse 1, God calls Moses, Aaron, and Aaron's sons, and 70 of the elders to come up and worship God uh, from afar. Verse 3 says, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all of the rules, and all of the people answered with one voice. And this is what they said after hearing all the things that God has told Moses, both before them and up on the mountain here. They say, all of the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do them. Israel makes the choice that we as Christians have to make today. They decide to follow this awesome God who has led them out of Egypt. And as hard as it was to stand before him, as much as they wanted to create distance between this powerful God and themselves, they now choose here to follow him. They will do the things that he says. They will become his people. Verse 7, then Moses took the, the book of the covenant and he read it in their hearing in front of the people. And they said again, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. We will be obedient to him. Israel makes the decision to accept the identity of God and the subsequent identity that he speaks upon them. They decide that they will follow this God who speaks in thunder, Yahweh, and keep his commands. They choose to find their identity in the one whose identity is unquestionable at this point, unchanging. We as the people of God today can make a similar choice. You know that this world is still trying to find its footing, right? In the midst of all the turmoil that's going on right now as we step into unknown times. It may feel to some of us tonight like this wilderness, this unknown period just keeps going on and on and on. You may not feel like the same person that you were at the beginning of this year here tonight, and that's okay. You may feel lost and wonder what exactly it is that God is trying to do in this world or where he's leading us, and that too is okay. It is hard to see where you are going sometimes when you're walking into the unknown. The key, at least for Israel in this story, is to look at the one whose identity is not threatened, not in the slightest by all of the chaos that surrounds us. And it's not always easy. Uh, sometimes it causes us to realize that the things that we thought were the most important in the world are not really the most important things. Sometimes we have to give up who we think we are to become the people that God has called us to be. What choice will you make? Will you choose to do what the Lord has spoken? Or will you, like Israel, for a brief moment did, stand frozen before Sinai and then turn back into the wilderness, hoping to find your bearings without him? The choice is yours tonight. It's not one that anyone else can make for you. You know, the most incredible thing happens at the end of this story here, whenever the children of Israel choose to follow God at Sinai. So Exodus chapter 24, verse 9, tells us that after accepting the covenant that God has proposed to make with them, Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders went up, and they saw the God of Israel. There, were un there was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God, they saw him, and they ate and drank. The same people who were unsure that they wanted to be near this God at all are now standing before him, looking at him. And they sit down and they eat together before him. Are they still nervous about being this close to him? Uh, probably, I would think so. Uh, but they have chosen to be his people. And now they have drawn near. They get an even clearer look here on the mountain where they eat with him of who he really is. And instead of being destroyed as they feared they might be, they are filled with food and drink as they sit before an almighty God. They see him now. And they may not yet feel comfortable, but they have a clearer picture of the one who has called them out of slavery and into a great inheritance. In the Gospels, we get another picture of what this looks like. The disciples sit in a room by themselves on the third day after Jesus was crucified, and they have heard the rumors some have even seen the empty tomb, but mostly they sit there questioning, what can we do now? 
They had chosen to identify with Jesus. They had followed him around for three years. They had been told that leaving everything they had would bring them more than they could ever imagine. And now they sit, alone in a room, scared for their lives, wondering if everything that they had put their faith in was truly wrong. Was Jesus not who we thought that he was? Was he not the one to save Israel? They have so many questions about what to do uh, that whenever Jesus appears to them, they're shocked. And you would think that this would be an exciting moment, right? Jesus has just shown back up. He, he was dead and now he's alive again. But he is also more than they thought he was, right? His identity now should be clear. And this is why they are shocked. Because he is clearly now, having risen from the dead, more than they thought that he was. He is the Messiah, but it's not just that. He is the Son of God, truly the Son of God. And their response, I think, sounds very familiar to us tonight. So in Luke chapter 24, verse 36, it says, As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it, and he ate it before them. The disciples see the one that they called teacher again, and instead of instant joy, they're afraid, because they think that they're seeing a ghost. But Jesus is no ghost. He speaks to them in a way that is also familiar for us tonight as we've looked at this passage. He doesn't tell them how ashamed he is that they ran away and deserted him. He doesn't try to tell them that what they have done uh, wrong up to this point is going to come back to bite them or scold them for being startled that he's appeared to them. He says, peace to you, and it is I. Jesus starts by making sure that they know who he is, that they know his identity. It's me. It's Jesus, the one you love, the one you followed all these years. I'm here. I'm standing before you. And when it hits them, they're overwhelmed with joy, but they just can't believe it. And so what does Jesus do? He says, let's eat. Do you have anything here to eat? And this time it is God incarnate who takes that food before them. And in their presence, he eats it. They may not understand what's happening just yet, but they know for sure that this man is their friend, their teacher. He's Jesus. And now they're sure also that he is the Lord. Jesus' identity is clearly seen here by his disciples when he sits with them and eats with them. And it affects their identity moving forward into what will turn out to be the most unknown, uh, the longest unknown time in their lives as they strive to follow Jesus after he's not around anymore. Jesus' words to his disciples in this scene still ring true for us today. Uh, though we have not physically seen Jesus, his words that forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, those words are still true today. So are his words that he spoke to his disciples in this very passage we're reading. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. If God's Spirit rests on you tonight, then you are witnesses of Christ's power in the world today. You know who he is. What does that mean for your identity tonight? Are you lost in this unknown? That you don't really know where you are or who you are? Or has Christ shown you what you have been called to do? Has he revealed to you his identity? And shown you what that means for you in your own life? Maybe tonight you want to see him more clearly. You want to receive this forgiveness that he offers. And the spirit of God that he sends on those who believe in his name. We're ready to help you be baptized tonight if that's what you would like to do. Maybe you aren't really sure. Uh, maybe you've followed him before, but now you stand in this 
unknown precipice, wondering what to do. Should you follow him further or should you stop? We encourage you to continue tonight, to put your trust in him and who he is and find yourself through him. Whatever the case, tonight I want to offer you the opportunity to proclaim Jesus' identity in your life and reach out and claim your own as children of his as we stand and as we sing together. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you as your children, both gathered together uh, physically and uh, electronically, and we thank you for this opportunity we've had to study your word, uh, to look at um, the promises you make, to look at uh, who you are, and uh, recognize that you have sacrificed much for us by sending your son having him come and live a perfect life for us. And then he comes back to you and he prepares a home for us. Sometimes we forget that, that this is not really our home, but help us to remember that that home is with you. Help us remember that the struggles and the ills and the, the things that go on around us are short term, that you are in control, and that whatever happens, uh, has happened throughout history in the past and that you still are in control. Help us to put our faith in you. Remember who you are. Remember what we've been told tonight about who you are and what you expect of your people. Uh, be with us. Help us to be examples to those around us this week. Help us to encourage those we come in contact with. Help us to take advantage of the opportunities that we're given. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.